Welcome back to Broadcasting Today. Today we'll be talking to Will Perrin, a pioneer of hyper-local websites where he engages citizens in the work of opening up public debate, and Jane Moat, who's responsible for launching London's latest TV channel, London Live. It's all part of our mission here at Middlesex University London to teach students how to think, but also how to do. Welcome to Broadcasting Today. Today we'll be speaking to Jane Moat, who's the launch director of London Live TV, London's newest channel, 24-7, and to Will Perrin, who's the director of Talk About Local. It's a real pleasure to have you both with us tonight. So, Jane, first of all, both of you welcome. Local news, you hate that word but many people use it. What's it for? I don't hate the word local news. I don't like London Life being called local because you can't be local to nine million people. Um, you know, our service will be for all Londoners on the linear channel, which is the conventional way to get television. When we have our service on non-linear and it's on demand and you can get access to stories in different ways, it's more likely to be local, so we'll have a hyper-local service behind it. But it's, it's not our channel, although it's come about because of the government's initiative around local TV, it is the least local of them all. You know, it's, it's the size of two Denmarks, it's bigger than Sweden, it's, and London is a nation unto itself. So it, it isn't local, but it is an opportunity to, to talk directly to an audience that has very similar interests and, and has a lot of things in common. How do you make sure you differentiate it from the other output, which, isn't, which is network output? How do you get that differentiation into this new channel, which is going to be not just at half an hour in the day, 24-7? Yeah. yeah. Well, obviously, it's 100% London, and uh, the, the networks are pushing out and they're establishing places in, in, in the north and in Wales and, and Scotland. That's all great. But we don't really care about anything beyond the M25, or we don't really care about anything beyond the M25. And it's such a relief to say that when you work in television, because there's been this big thing to say, you know, we've got to push out beyond the M25. We don't. We can absolutely, unashamedly celebrate London. And also the other thing that networks tend to do, and I have to say some regional services, they tend to be quite top down. They look at London. They, they, they just sort of um, helicopter above and say, we know this about you. Well, we're not going to be like that. We're from the ground up. We're here to be part of London. We're in London. We all love it. We all hate it. But we're all the same. And I think that attitude and that um, will lead to huge opportunities for everybody to just have a breath of fresh air into television. And my goodness, it needs it. Well, presumably that's music to your ears, having gone down the hyper-local route to re-engage the citizen with the chance to have their say in public discourse. This is precisely the sort of thing that you would be able to feed into. Not well, we don't know yet, of course, if we can feed into it. And I, I really hope local websites can, because across the capital there are a dozen or two or three or four, we don't really know how many, local websites, Twitter streams, Facebook pages, um, all sorts of online groups, little forums, newspapers online, serving extremely granular communities. Um, so in King's, you don't care about anything outside the M25, I don't care about anything outside King's Cross. And it's great. We can provide an incredibly detailed, granular, um, community-based perspective to an audience there. An audience that, that is very much uh, come literally from the ground up. We, we started a website in King's Cross to help with local civic action. I had cars on fire outside my house about twice a week in King's Cross, way about 10 or 12 years ago when I first got stuck into civic action there. And after four or five years, I realized that most civic action was a form of communication. It was a huge communications exercise. And that the web was becoming easier and easier to use. Anybody can set up a blog. It's very, very simple. You don't have to have any programming skills. I've never written a line of HTML in my life, and I hope I die that way. It's just not necessary at all. Um, and so I created a very simple blog that's grown and grown and grown and now has a good, a good strong audience in King's Cross on a blog. But it's fascinating and now it's fragmenting off into a completely different audience on Twitter and an even bigger audience again on Facebook of people who travel through King's Cross and all the students who've now come to the area uh, in the big central St. Martin's development. So we have a much more granular perspective and I hope it can contribute to these bigger news pictures. Um, 
And I have to agree, I agree strongly with the sentiments about regional TV that looks down, often frankly down its nose at, um, the regions it, it claims to report on. And anything we can do to break that up, these huge state-sponsored monopolies of regional television, is, is to the good. I suppose the question, Jane, then becomes how do you mediate all this extra activity that's going on, which in theory should help uh, give a different flavour to what you're trying to achieve, how do you do it? How do you, it's the kind of mechanics of doing that. Our position it? is a platform for Londoners, so we are created in order to give space for Londoners, and that means there will be a lot of material coming in, and we are going to have to organise it all and curate it and put content that we think the whole of London wants to see. Not all of it will be interesting to anybody else in London. Human interest stories travel well, but something about your local refuse collection is not going to be of interest in another part of London. So I think having the, the, the two layers helps enormously and we don't want to replicate what's going on we want to give a platform to it so if that means that we're we're, we're giving an amplification using the the um, unique users that we already have access to via the standard and the independent and the i great that's what we'll do but we also want to um, make sure that people have a direct conversation with us in our, in our news output and probably in other parts of the schedule as well. So we'll use, use second screen a lot and we'll put the conversation on air. We won't just say, tell us what you think and then we'll just put it in a filing cabinet somewhere or you know, we'll, we'll shove it in part of the computer that we never open. We want that to be part of the story. We want um, viewers in London to actually contribute to how we change the channel all the time. So that's going to be a big part of it. And then the, the, some of the content that comes through from the micro areas, we, you know, we're hoping to have a, a network of vloggers and, and to have um, a lot of contributors on the ground who might mainly talk to their own community, but they might want some of that content to be seen. We'll be looking at that constantly and we'll create at least a weekly programme specifically for that, which um, the working title of it at the moment is Postcode London. And it will be a place where we pay people if we find their clip and use it, we'll give them a payment and we'll put that on as a show at the weekend so people can see some of the gems that are coming out of, of our local user-generated content. Of course, you, you're not unfamiliar to this whole business about launching new programmes, especially for London. You did it for public broadcast, you did it for the BBC. Yeah. Uh, and I wonder how different it is to do it in the commercial environment. Um, whether you can be more fleet of foot, whether there's less problem about conventional structures, whether there's more of an open mind about it. Well, it depends on which part of the commercial world you're in. You know, the Evening Standard is very fleet of foot. I mean, it made a huge, brave decision to go free, and it has made money from it, and it acts quickly, which is not like the culture of most large organisations, including commercial organisations. You can make decisions quickly, which is just as well, because we're meant to be on air in March. So that's fantastic. So I'm not too worried um, about getting things done and getting them done quickly. Do you think that the professionals uh, are capable of really getting what kind of service the people who feed into your output actually deliver? I think the really good ones are, yes, um, but um, they're often constrained by extremely rigid management hierarchies and um, a system of regulation that is frankly fr from, from the arc. Um, yeah. It's really, really out of touch. So the BBC, um, some years ago when the BBC would first approach me and my King's Cross website to do a piece on something we'd written, the, when I picked up the phone the, the approach would always be along the lines of, hello little man, uh, it's your lucky day, you've been selected to be on television, aren't you lucky? Now come up and give, up, give us four hours of your day in the middle of your working day while we ponce around with cameras um, trying to find some light and get out of the rain in King's Cross to film your piece and then if you're really lucky we'll cut that down to maybe five seconds um, next to some mad guy on, on evening news. Um, that approach has evolved over, over the years and now we have a, a very strong working relationship with for instance Tom Edwards, the BBC's excellent uh, environment and transport correspondent and Tom plays fast and loose with a lot of rules in, in my view and of course he might say he sticks to them all I'm sure um, but he's very experimental in his approach and he's worked extremely well with bloggers including my own blog in King's Cross on the sort of appalling slaughter of cyclists that's taken place over the last four or five years um, and he He's written some very intelligent pieces where he shows a very clear understanding of how bloggers in particular um, herd and group around issues and topics and how we can help feed that pack. It's a very sophisticated, clever understanding of what's going on out there. And as you look around the UK, my business works all, all over the UK helping people find a voice online for themselves. You see in most um, BBC, but very rarely in the commercial side actually, 
most BBC regional operations, and remember these are regional, they're, they're based on a tr Cold War transmitter network called Backbone, which, which put masts on the top of the highest hills and everything grew up from that. It has nothing to do with proper demography or topography at all. Um, uh, you can find one or two people who really seem to get it and have the freedom to do it. Um, but on the whole, people are far too constrained by their managerial structures and, and occasionally a slight sense of, of um, uh, the old uh, Frost report, I, I'm superior to him sketch, and, uh, and, which looks all the way down And actually, the, the question about saying the professionals, I don't think there's a capital T, capital P, and, that, and that's not how we view things. Uh, I think there needs to be a lot more trust of what people um, are saying on the ground and what they really know. And when I was in the BBC, um, we, I found this guy had been given some funding. He was a civil engineer and he was in his 50s and he'd got one of the Millennium Funds to make a film. And he made a film um, about his daughter who'd been killed at 21, delivering her final essay in London for her nursing exam. And um, she'd been on a bicycle and it was turning left. And this was 14 years ago. Um, uh, so, so the lorry was turning left and it, it, it took her out and he was so incensed that he hired a whole set of lorries, skid pan, bicycle, um, cyclists and actually reenacted and worked out exactly what was wrong with the lorries and when I showed this film that he made which was not emotional it was absolutely factually correct made by an engineer you know a 22 year old lad in Bristol said well what does he know about it he's not a journalist and that was the BBC's attitude. And I don't think it's changed much. They don't recognise when people know things and they don't value it because they layer themselves with all of the, 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 the legislation and the regulation and all reasons not to do things. And the other thing that's really important about regulation is what it's done is squash opinion. Yeah. So it's all so homogenised and, and, and mundane and mediocre. And if you play to the letter of every regulator that's ever been on earth and then add editorial policy on top, that's what you'll get. But broadcasters have got to take risks. You know, they're, they're, they're guidelines, they're not rule books. So I think we will be trying to, to be a much more risk-taking environment and we'll, we'll fall foul of things and then we'll learn from it and we'll move on. But we have to trust people, we have to trust what they've got to say and, and if things are wrong, we just have to be honest that something went wrong. How do you ingest that sense of value into your output? Is it just by having the people there or is there more that you will need to do for the audience to say, that's great to hear for those people. It's made me think differently. I, I think you actually have to use their content. That's the first thing. And, and try not to change it. You know, in the non-news output, we've been very clear that where we're taking people who've been on YouTube for ages and have had fantastic success and, you know, huge audiences, we don't want to take that creativity out of them. We don't want to, we don't want to spoil them by putting them into one of our formats. The reason why we're interested in them is because of their formats. And I think what happens with a lot of the bigger broadcasters is that they, they try to confine them in what they know. Yes. And then nothing moves on nothing changes and the broadcast world should be evolving as fast as the mechanisms are evolving and that is very fast indeed so will when you get this sense of change within that environment do you think that you can see that possibility that the value that you believe and the people who contribute to your output believes can be translated into a a broadcasting environment or does it always get mediated to the point other than with Tom Edwards who I agree with you is a fantastic journalist and does a good job on not just the bicycling issue is there are there enough Tom Edwards well, you've got to get out of the broadcasting mindset. You know, broadcasting is about standing on top of a hill and squirting your electromagnetic stuff at millions of people who are grateful to receive it. Uh, and you've got to get out of that. You have to build a relationship with the audience and value them as contributors um, to the, thing, the story you are trying to tell. Um, so, uh, as you were saying, it's very much a case of it, the proof of the pudding is in what, what you actually use. Mm. So it's all very well saying we want to build a relationship with the audience and send us all your stuff, but if it then isn't used, the audience will very quickly uh, go away and find somewhere else to do it. So I have hilarious encounters with um, mainstream media organisations who approach me to use things that are on my website, and they always try and find a way of not paying for them. Um, so the Daily Mail uh, approached me uh, to use a, a video I had uh, up on YouTube and I went in this hilarious exchange which is on my, on my website um, of, because he, he didn't think about that enough, um, of um, <laughs> why, 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 you won't, why you won't pay for my video. Well, you're the world, you've just told me you're the world's largest online newspaper, that's why I should give you the video because it would be a great thing. Well, then you can pay me for it or make a donation to a charity. Uh, recently, Huffington Post UK approached me to use a photograph of the 
a hideous cycle accident in Hoban at Vernon, uh, Vernon Place, where a cyclist was seriously injured and died five, five days later. I took a photograph of the bus uh, involved in the crash. Um, uh, they approached me on Twitter, can we use your photo with credit? I went back and said, if you make a hundred pounds donation to Break UK, the road safety charity, never heard from them again. Um, and so that kind of thing is just poor and it's very common behavior. We know that in media, there's often called a media ecology and news ecology. That's because people keep eating each other and nicking things off, the, off their table. Um, it's just like a, a nature documentary. Um, and um, uh, sometimes if you're a big organization, you should pay a few quid to the little guys. Um, and it's often not the financial reward they seek, it's more the recognition in a sense that this is of value to a large news organization. Very good project over in Birmingham that Trinity Mirror did over the years um, with working with local bloggers to take their content and uh, put it in the print newspaper, but it was done with a proper byline. It wasn't just nicked uh, and repurposed, uh, which you see quite a lot of with local blogs, unfortunately, uh, their content being reused. It was, re it was properly repurposed with a proper byline um, and a proper credit, and they would offer to help and work with local bloggers. They did a very good job over there, and it's an example anyone else could follow. What do you think of the key criteria for a hyper-local site? What are the key things that they should be trying to achieve? An intimacy with, with your place and, and your audience. So um, there, there's no strict definition of a hyper-local site um, they, because it might not be a site. It could be a Twitter feed. It could be it could be Facebook. Um, increasingly, you know, the audience is in Facebook. That's where you've got to go. Um, or, or it could be a YouTube channel, uh, or it could, could be a traditional blog or a traditional website. Um, and hyperlocal can mean, in many ways, um, what you want it to mean, but it is usually um, people who care about the area in which, about which they're writing. They either live there or work there or are very close by to that area, and they want to find a voice for that place online. And the definition can, uh, can encompass, it's, it's more a sort of a metonym, really, than a definition. It can encompass everything from the scale of the Sheffield Forum, um, in Sheffield, which is a traditional V bulletin based uh, discussion forum. It's got, in a city of 450,000 people, it's got 180,000 members and 6 million posts. So it dwarfs any other media for the city of Sheffield, all the way down to websites like parwitch.org in Derbyshire, which is a village of 500 people. They get 750 page views a day and has a team of seven working on a website about a village. And I know, because I've spoken to them, the Archer scriptwriters pillage it for ideas for the show. <laughs> so you've got a full spectrum from big urban sites to tiny rural ones. Um, and uh, all of those fit within, usually fit within this uh, ambit of hyperlocal site. When you come to try and translate this, Jane, I mean, one of the th issues that you've been talking about is vlogging. How are you going to be able to trust the output of the vlogger? Yeah. Well, just to explain why it's vlogging and I, uh, if anyone can come up with a better name we'd love to have a title for somebody who creates a video blog for us and i will definitely pay you how much should we pay you 100 pounds if you come up with a name that we use so there we go that's an offer um but <laughs> the, the the vlogging thing is because you know we're part of, of of a newspaper group we've got lots of words in our building and on on, on our airwaves or our internet um, airwaves. Um, what, what we don't have is lots of pictures and we are about video so our contribution to the piece is video so we're really keen to to try to get off the ground more video blogging which hasn't really become anything in this country of note so I think it's something new that we can work on and we're going to be working in partnership with a few organisations that are already involved in this can't announce it yet, nearly there. Um, uh, so some of the uh, vloggers will be sourced through a partnership where we know that they've been trained and they've got the right um, accreditation and, and so on. Because obviously we want to make sure that, um, that, that we don't want to take their voice away, but they don't fall foul of, of, of some of the basics in law and, and libel and so on. Um, and then we will be looking at our own system of a accreditation so we'll ask people we'll probably put something in the standard in the new year saying to people if you want to be a vlogger let us know um, and people will come in and see us and show us their work to date and we'll take it from there. Um, will this be something which you have to mediate you know a, a weekly program or something like that I mean no, 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 we, I, want, we want the, the want blogs to, to pop up wherever they are in in, in the hyper local sites yeah. and then as I said we'll do a weekly show which will bring out some of the best content and we hope to get to know our vloggers as well so that if big stories break we could start to rely on some of them or at least you know if there was a massive story break and we didn't have a journalist there yet we could say well one of our vloggers called something else nicer um, is, is already there that you know, they're, they're going to hold the fort for us. And we, we, we want to be honest with people. If people are not trained journalists, we'll say so. Um, and you know, if somebody's holding the fort, then we'll, we'll give them the recognition for that. It's a big risk. 
What's risky about it? I don't understand why, why that's a big risk. That's your BBC head, Kurt. Take it out. <laughs> What's the risk? If we're honest with the audience and we say, you know, we can't be there. Somebody we know who's regularly uploading content to our site, who we, we've met and we've talked to and they understand the basics, they're there for now. And if whilst they're saying something live on our channel, if something goes wrong, we'll just say, oh, actually, we probably should have said this. It's how you recover so, situations. But I wouldn't make the assumption that it's a risk. No, and I think look it's at exciting. The, the big success that The Guardian has had with its um, witness product uh, as well recently, powered by uh, the notice software underpinning that, that gives you a very, very easy, easy way of moderating huge streams of incoming content. And they've managed that really skillfully. They've gone for everything from uh, the really tough issues like Thatcher's funeral, where I was submitting stuff from the route to that, which made it into the Guardian blog um, from, from me and my, with my phone, um, through, through to pictures of wet pets. You know, they, they've skillfully managed, very skillfully managed there, um, using those tools, um, a, a user contributor audience to play to all, all the things that interest people about a big news publication. And um, regulation is, is terribly stifling because um, one of the reasons I, I uh, as someone who used to work in the civil service, I was I could never understand why all my friends who are interested in politics found, found Question Time so exciting on TV. I thought it was an awful show, you know, it, and, but they, they like it because it's full of emotion. It's full of reality. It's how people feel. They express themselves. They get angry about things, which is something you never see on, on the TV news um, for reasons good and bad. There does need to be a long stop somewhere that stops it getting out of hand. Um, but one must reflect people's emotion and t intensity of feeling. And that's so often what, what blogs and self-published media do because they can't find another outlet for it. Do you think people's viewing habits have to change to accept the product that you're going to present to them? No, We're not at all, because because the viewing habits have changed and change all the time. So, you know, I'm really grown up about the fact that a lot of people won't watch us on television. You know, uh, most of the young people that we've already surveyed and spoken to don't own televisions. They're going to consume media on their mobile devices or on their PCs, and that's fine. We just want them to see our content and we want them to participate. So we will be streamed um, uh, live and we will have an on-demand service as well. So, you know, we'll be absolutely catering for people to be able to have a long form, short form, um, streamed form, anything, as long as they enjoy it and take something from it. And it helps if we can count them because then we can make some money out of it. Talking about money, we'll raise that issue of the ecology yeah. and to sustain the output in the way you want to, there is going to have to be some compromise, isn't there? on payment for some of that content coming from very local vloggers, yeah. uh, you know, people who make contributions on small websites. There's going to have to be some money flow in that direction. As I said, you know, we're going to be able to pay people for their contributions if they get selected for the linear channel. And I think also one of the things we, we want to be doing is to offer a, a, a scaling up in terms of SEO, search engine optimization for people, because we'll be able to be a bigger platform. So cross-connecting and making sure that we're, we're helping to for them to grow in their own world and monetize what they do is a big part of what we'll be about. You know, we need to to have the mutuality of a partnership with people, and and we'll be looking at that. And there's no doubt that our commitments as a station within a quarter of the population of Britain are huge and expensive and you know we're not likely to break even for four years so you know we, we've got a lot of work cut out and we've got to get all our content in at cheaper price than anybody does on any other TV platform other than the local stations that will be running at a lower rate than us. Will do you think that the future of hyper local stations, uh, blogs, uh, Facebook, that relies on money or does that rely on passion? Or does it rely on a combination of both? Because if that ecology is going to thrive, not everyone's going to do it endlessly for nothing, are they? Uh, people have been doing the Church of England endlessly for nothing for over 400 years now. Uh, the Boy Scouts movement's just celebrated its centenary. It's run by volunteers. The Women's Institute is a formidable organisation run by volunteers. Outside of London, the magistracy is largely run by volunteers. Volunteering has an enormously important part in Britain's civic and social structure. Um, and you can see that in any community you go into, huge amounts of volunteer time are put into things for the good of the community. And what we see with most hyperlocal blogs is an extension of that into modern electronic media. Um, and of course, because they don't have to turn a profit, um, they don't have to pay insurance, they don't have to pay staff, they don't have to run a pension fund, um, uh, their, their sustainability is actually uh, pretty good in, in many cases. So. Um, 
I, I, I don't think the future for many blogs is necessarily in becoming commercial. But what we are starting to see is that some successful websites are running at a more commercial bent now. They're becoming um, small businesses and they're slowly starting to grow. Um, and look at, for instance, on the Isle of Wight, the, the magnificent Ventnor blog there, which dominates uh, news on, on the Isle of Wight. It gives the old county press there a, a really strong run for its money, run by husband and wife team as a small business. Or in London, uh, LondonSE1.com, a superb website for news about Lambeth, run as a small business, it had its origins in, in a community printed sheet a few years ago. And that there are an increasing number like that. Um, but what they find hard, of course, is that local newspapers and local television is very heavily subsidised um, by the government in a variety of different ways. Local newspapers receive between 30 and 50 million pound subsidy a year, which they, they don't boast about, um, from mandatory advertising of road closure notices and planning applications, that sort of thing. It's a very, very, very heavy subsidy. Um, local TV stations will each receive uh, up to 243,000 pounds a year in, in channel programming buyback from the BBC, and the network is receiving a 70 million pound subsidy in, into the hardware. 150,000 in the first year, and then it reduces to 65. Then, sorry, my numbers are out of date, so you, you should know those numbers, but it's still a good slug of money. Um, so and 85 stories a month. <laughs> which I don't quite see how we're going to deliver. We'll see how it works. But anyway, the notion is there that this is something that could be subsidised. And uh, that doesn't extend to local blogs. It's very hard to see um, any local blogs who've received a grant from a charitable organisation, from Big Lottery, for instance. They don't seem to make grants to them. Um, and they don't certainly don't get money from public subvention. Here's a rub, because lots of students, of course, and we've been joined by lots of students, we're saying, want to work for the BBC or ITV, all those traditional places. But actually, what I'm hearing from you is, get yourself a blog get yourself out there, get yourself busy. Yeah, you've got to, as a student, um, it's terribly hard uh, at the moment in a very difficult jobs market. I graduated in the early 90s recession, so, so I, kinda, I know roughly how you feel. Um, you have to market yourself incredibly strongly. Um, and the best way to do that is to use these free publishing tools and start writing about something. It is an easy way to do it. It's relatively harmless, relatively pain-free, and it gives you practice in writing things that other people want to read. And of course, you can choose as a student to direct your energies into the particular the things that look a bit like the field you might want to go into, maybe. Um, but this was an opportunity that wasn't around when, when I was a student to um, actually create your own media and publish under your own steam without having to spend any money on it. And uh, I, I can't believe, and of course I don't recruit um, people in the publishing or broadcast industry, but I, I find it hard to believe that anyone who presents who is not publishing for themselves is going to get a serious look in, uh, really, unless there's something exceptional going on in the background. In some ways, that's a great opportunity for you, isn't it, Jane? The, the idea that the traditional gatekeepers have kind of kept that out of their content. But now you're saying, actually, is it, uh, we're a different kind of gatekeeper. Well, I hope we're not. I, I don't like to see ourselves as a gatekeeper. I hope we're, we're opening the gate um, widely. And, you know, we're recruiting 50 roles at the moment. I'm interviewing 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Um, except today. Uh, it's it's full you. on it, at the moment. And, and the um, you know, it's interesting because, Kurt, when... When I spotted you all those years ago, when I was at Newsroom South East and about to create BBC London, it was because you'd put your head above the parapet and I read about you in a magazine doing something new and different in television. And, and you, you, know, you took some risks and that's what people need to do. And, and people who are looking to do new things are looking at people who are already doing new things. And we have consciously set about a, a fresh talent um, concept for the for the channel and it's very strange because you're actually saying no to some people who are very experienced and and but they've, they've been uniformed they've been conditioned they've come with all this baggage of this is how we do television news and they come in their little suits mine's only a half suit um, and uh, you know they, they, they sort of behave in a certain way and, and we want we don't want that so um, you either take somebody like that and try and knock th that out of them, which we will do in some instances, or you look at people who've already made a name for themselves in small ways, but they've, they've, they've done stuff. And it's all about flying hours. You know, when you start out in broadcasting, or all the time in broadcasting, is how many flying hours do you get? So put yourself out there, take risks. You've got community radio, you've got community television, you've got local television, you've got London television, you've got blogs, you've got websites, I mean you've got more than anything and yes it's going to be harder to, to be found because there's so much stuff but just get louder and do more ridiculous things and we can't wait to see what you do. Of course students who go to university don't get a degree in vlogging or blogging, they tend to get degrees in journalism so it begs the question of course is whether this output is journalism. 
Oh, Will. without a doubt. I mean, you know, this capital J's come back in. You know, it, it doesn't need to be there. Yes, of course, there are regulations and laws that you need to know. And you should look at what's gone before because it'll all be reinvented and come around like a circle again. But, but that real journalism is about having a completely open mind and asking questions that haven't been asked before. And, and if that's the, the case, then you absolutely are going to do new things. So, you know, the, the, the courses should not be in aspic. I'm hoping they're not. I hope that they change every year. And if they need to change more often, they should. We, we will change. We're not going to be the same on launch day to what will be a year later. No way. We can't afford to be because the world's changing much faster than that. Will, journalism? No. Um, I don't uh, believe in... You, you can't, in journalism, you can't defy, say the journalism without including the Coulsons and the Wades. I'm afraid, whether they're innocent or guilty for the purpose of the public camera thing that, and contempt of court. Um, and uh, you, have to remember, his training too. you have to remember, <laughs> you have to remember, though, that um, uh, the, peop the news of the world was Britain's most commercially successful news outlet. And, and look what happened. So for me as a citizen, and, and a lot of the people I, I worked, with, um, worked with over the years who run hyperlocal blogs, um, we were finding a voice for ourselves because we felt we weren't represented by journalists, whether it was BBC London or the Islington Gazette in my case, which is a decent enough local paper. Uh, although it does have a sort of if it bleeds, it leads strategy, which is always a bit depressing. Um, uh, and we are finding our own voice. And so much of traditional J school journalism training is about things that are accidents of the production process that has evolved over the last hundred years, whether it's for print or for broadcast since the 1930s. And that constrains people's ability to express themselves. And I, I certainly, um, you know, I don't go around saying, I, I believe, believe in things too often, but I believe in society, everyone can find a, a wonderful way of expressing themselves about things they're passionate in. And that shouldn't any longer be constrained by antiquated production workflows and technologies and regulations. And that's the joy of blogging. So I don't think it is journalism because my perception of journalism has always been that it is about these huge workflows and also about some quite unpleasant stuff as well, which I don't particularly want to be associated with. But one can argue that for two long. People are telling stories in different ways that help change society. And that's the really important thing. Oh, and the other thing is, uh, you know, that's really important in journalism that has been lost because of the 24-hour news machine with cutbacks in the e ecology is in investigations. And people do need to be inspired to continue to ask difficult questions, to go further than the press release. And, and, and really, the standards have got much, much worse in those areas. And, and I, I would absolutely support any education in, th in that area and, and again ordinary citizens are more likely to ask those difficult questions because they're not, they're not straight jacketed as much. They might actually have more time than a lot of people working in the big newsrooms. So, so, so at that, point, hold on, that, that last point on time is really important. So in King's Cross we had a, a terrible cycling death uh, two and a, uh, just about two years ago now. A young, a young woman, a student very much like many of you in her first year at uh, Central St Martins was, was killed by a lorry on York Way, on a way to, on a way to, um, no, no, mine was on, 14 years before. No, on, on a way, on, on her way to, to, to CSM, um, and um, I didn't really know what to do with it. Even though I ran the King's Cross blog, we didn't lead with the story um, because Urban 75, the Brixton blog, uh, which has been going for many years, the Lambeth uh, South London blog, had some very graphic pictures. The fit pictures, the young woman's body was lying in the street for some hours because the, the traffic meant the coroners couldn't get there, the, the undertakers couldn't get there. So it was awful. And we didn't know what to do about it because as a community, we'd felt for a long time the junctions were very dangerous for pedestrians, for all road traffic, including cyclists. So we didn't do a knee-jerk response to it at all. Um, I, I thought about it for 10 days. Um, and then we realised that, well, we, we as a community have been on a walk with Transport for London some, some, some years ago where we identified that this was a dangerous junction. And I remembered I'd published a report on a blog, so I dug it out from three years before. Um, and then I suddenly said, well, hang on a minute, they had a report that has a phrase in it, the junction is like a battleground, casualties are inevitable. And they did nothing about it. So surely there's a corporate manslaughter case here. And so I wrote a long blog post on why this was, this was, uh, there was a possible liability for TfL for corporate manslaughter. And this, um, in the context then of the mayor election, was like a spark in petrol. This caused an enormous um, conflagration of anger amongst the cycling community and uh, attracted a lot of political interest. And that was because I had time to think about it. And I appreciate that, you know, that while there are a lot of trade skills in broadcast journalism, but you don't have much time to think because you've got to get it out there quickly. Um, and then the Times picked it up. It got into the Times several time, uh, on several occasions. Uh, BBC ran with it on a number of occasions. And uh, only recently we heard the police investigated. Only recently we heard from the Crown Prosecution Service they weren't going ahead with the case. But we think we, that we will get there in the end on corporate manslaughter. And cyclists. You say that 
in the event that this hyper-local system delivers mistakes, it's kind of self-correcting. Sort of you, your phrase, I think, is uh, wisdom of crowds, if, I haven't, if I'm not misquoting you. That somehow, even if it's wrong, it will be corrected. That is the nature of this beast, which is uh, local, hyper-local, constant flow of stories. People will correct it. Uh, yes, it gets corrected in the comments, but let's not uh, traditional journalism get on its high horse here. You know, we've seen the Sun's measly corrections recently for the big mistakes they made in stories on immigration that they led on the front page and these tiny little things have appeared later in the newspaper to say that they were wrong um, on the fundamentals of a story. So let's not get too hung up about that, um, about this whole correcting stuff being the be-all and end-all of, of media. And we know from you know, and, you know, the history of the BBC and in its approach to the audience that disagrees with it has been points of view where it's Essentially, they parody um, uh, people who write letters to them by giving them funny voices o over the last 20 years, and that's, that's nonsense. Um, so, uh, yes, in most blogs, things are corrected in the comments. And, of course, what you always have to watch for is, um, as someone moderating those comments, that, that you are careful that you do not moderate out people who disagree with you. That starts then to undermine the credibility of your website. Let's have some questions from the floor. Got enough questions here. Who wants to kick off? Paul. Can you tell us a little bit more about the programming plans for London Live? Um, well, it's five and a half hours of news and current affairs every day, and we're not going to have news and current affairs. We're going to try to come up with some new ways of merging the two. Um, and outside of that, we're an entertainment channel. And the new, not outside of that, because the news will be entertaining as well. We, want, we don't want people to be glum about London. I mean, there's an awful lot of good stuff going on. Entertainment news, film news, um, uh, you know, travel, weather, all sorts of things. So outside of that, um, we're, we're on Channel 8 on free view which is and, and 117 on sky and, and 159 on virgin so it's really important that we entertain tv's an entertaining um, medium so we'll be running um entertainment shows some of them acquired so we've just done a big deal with channel four and one with bbc worldwide and we'll be showing peep show misfits from channel four amongst others uh 2012 from the bbc um and dramas like Shadowline and, and all sorts of entertaining content that's already there. And then we're commissioning content. So we haven't announced any of our commissions yet, but we're commissioning factual entertainment, comedy, drama, and we'll be doing live performances from different events across London. And then post 11 o'clock, we're going to have a zone called Raw, which is for complete newcomers to TV, people who are trying new things out, probably not commercial. You know, it's not going to help to drive our commercial success, but it's part of this platform for Londoners. Um, so we're, we're opening up Raw to putting on some really unusual, entertaining new formats, a um, bit more risky, um, and, and, and that will run uh, throughout the week as well. More question, yes. The front uh, what here. sort of impact do you think London Live will have on the television industry? I hope it's going to shake them up. I hope it's going to give them loads of ideas. Um, I hope they're going to steal loads of our staff because they'll be so um, wanting to get their hands on them. And that's fine. And then we'll bring on new people. Um, but yeah, we, if, we don't, if we don't make people think, we haven't done our jobs right. And, and I'm not professing that we'll do all of that on day one because it's a bit of a rush to the finish at the moment or to the start. Um, and uh, it won't be right on day one. You know, there'll be a lot of things we really like and a lot of things we haven't quite sorted yet. Um, but we hope that the industry will keep looking at it um, and hopefully not nervously um, with anticipation of what they can nick next. Uh, what made you sort of realise that there was a gap in the market for a channel like London Live? Well, funny enough, it's the government that, that saw that there was a gap. Um, but it does go back to when I started BBC London and I'd been working in Wales. I ran BBC Wales today there. Um, and there, there was a whole assembly thing about to happen in Wales. But, you know, that was, I can't remember what the population was of Wales, but it was about less than a half of what London was. And I came to Newsom South East and we were covering Banbury Market and Dover Docks and London, by the way, in the middle. It was 12.8 million people, the region then. And I really thought that London needed to have its own voice. So I made it as small as I could at the BBC. And I really felt that it ought to be rooted in London. So we set up district offices, all closed now. Um, and, and we put people out where stories were. And I thought we could really change things. And I passionately believe that London needed its own voice. And I was very proud of London. I still am. I think it's, you know, 
know, one of the best cities, if not the best city in the world. And I find it extraordinary that there's no service here. You know, if you look at New York, same sort of size, you know, there's more than one station there. And, and just because one channel tried it and failed, and they failed because they tried to imitate um, other networks, um, doesn't mean that in today's world where we've got cheaper point of entry on technology um, and, and a greater access to airwaves that we can't make it successful. So um, I was asked to help write the bid for, for the London Evening Standard and the other thing that really interested me was trying to see whether that newspaper model could work um, and, and whether that entrepreneurism that existed at the Standard could help us to, to, to create something really sustainable in, in, in London. So, yeah, it's well overdue. And all of that effort that we did at the BBC, yes, we had a radio station, we did on TV, on radio, online, first ones to do that with the, the website, but it's an hour of TV a day. I mean, all of that effort from the BBC. And I said at the time, why don't you just do local TV? And, and Oxford had its own station at that stage. And, and I said, well, in Oxford, why don't you at least try it there? Because, it, it, you know, some people are only interested in their own area. <laughs> and, um, you know, the BBC couldn't get its head round. And to be fair, you know, it would have been hard to justify to all the licence fee payers, etc. But that's where the commercial world can do something because London's a good market. You know, there's a lot of money in London as well. It's worth pointing out as well, the original concept for local TV that the government thought it was adopting, what is now the government, was for locally integrated media operations. So it was the original idea was for local media companies that were newspaper, television, mm. possibly radio as well. And Roger Parry, the guy who wrote the report that Jeremy Hunt then turned into policy in the Conservative Manifesto in 2010, um, he, he, he says quite candidly that local television stations standalone haven't got an economic hope. Um, and so I do worry a bit about stations we see elsewhere in the country, not, not least because, you know, they have smaller audiences, it's going to be harder, mm -hmm. that are not integrated locally with other media forms. That's going to be tough um, because there is this uh, strangeness about, about, about media markets that you can sell advertising for telly, you can sell advertising for print, but selling it for digital, you're only getting a tiny fraction of what you get for those other two media, um, at least um, uh, in the way the market's currently structured. So. Um, I think the London operation has the biggest chance of success um, for, for many of those reasons as, as well as others. But there are some around the country which have, you know, in Nottingham they're, they're aligned to the, the Evening Post and in Brighton, which is a very small area, it's aligned to an existing print business um, that's into the entertainment world. So I think there will be some interesting models springing up and some of them will be more pure community operations, but, um, that, you know, they're not all one, one size fits all. And obviously, the London size means it has to be different. Well, Jane, we wish you all the very best with uh, London Live TV. I'm sure with your passion and your foresight and your experience, if anyone can make it work, you will. I hope so. And Will, I think you've got a point of partnership there to take you your uh, local hyper site onto a new level. And obviously, this growing ecology will service what ordinary folk really want, which is real stories to be heard and to make a difference. And I thank you both for coming along and sharing your insight with us. Thank you. Thank you.